So again, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of our panelists um, for their time and their perspectives uh, this evening. I look forward to all of your questions and to our discussion together. So Nick, at this point, I will turn Thanks it over to you. very much, Neil, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very excited that we're having this event. Um, this is a topic that has been a passion of mine for well over 10 years now um, throughout my career in libraries, uh, ever since realizing the uh, huge digital divide that exists in our world today. And it's only getting worse as more and more information is accessed solely online. Um, and uh, one of the primary things that public libraries have done through all of this is to try to bridge that gap for the people who are most at risk. And uh, in my time in Chillicothe, I was the director of the Chillicothe and Ross County Library before coming to Athens. And then as well in my time here in Athens, um, I have tried to find ways to use the library's resources to help to bridge that gap. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and go around the panel now to do a brief introduction um, of our panelists. But before that, we are going to roll out a poll. And I hope that this is going to go smoothly, he said, uh, aside to Jen. Um, but uh, we're going to roll out a poll to everybody to tell us uh, a little bit about who you are um, so that we can have a sense of the audience here today. There's the poll. Um, so just uh, if you could, over the next few minutes, um, identify where you are in any of those categories, and we'll go ahead and start going around our panelists. So uh, we're going to go alphabetically by first name. So Dr. Amy Wolf, uh, please tell us about yourself. Hi. Um, so I, as I was filling out the poll, um, I found myself falling into multiple categories, which I think you probably, many of you also um, do. I'm here representing my life as a parent in this interesting time in um, this interesting region. Um, but I'm also a faculty member at Ohio University Chillicothe campus. And I'm also a teacher, so I share that perspective and my heart is a teacher. Um, I work in the teacher preparation program at Ohio University Chillicothe. So my students are engaged in learning experiences in the classroom with K to 12, pre-K to 12, um, students. Um, I guess that is sort of an overview of who I am and why I'm here on this panel. Um, I look forward to hearing all of your perspectives. Thank you. And Austin Gilbert. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Austin Gilbert. I'm a current employee of the Athens County Public Library. Um, I served for four years as a digital literacy instructor, first for the Meigs County District Public Library, and then for a year at Athens County. It was through a program called Guiding Ohio Online, which is a state library program that places instructors in rural and low income Ohio libraries to assist in closing the digital literacy gap. Uh, through my time with Guiding Ohio, I led group and individual instructional sessions covering digital topics from beginner computer use to intermediate and advanced technical skills. And in between classes and tutoring sessions, I provided just sort of on-demand tech support for patrons who needed troubleshooting of any of their existing tech. So I feel I'm well-versed with the uh, current digital issues facing a lot of my neighbors and community members and our library patrons. I have answered just about every technical question under the sun at this point. So I think that's um, a pretty decent overview of where I am. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is Claudia Cisneros Mendez. Hi, thank you, Nick. Um, well, first I want to thank the OU Libraries, the Athens County Libraries, the College of Health Sciences and Professions, and also the Appalachian Rural Health Institute uh, for this invitation, as well as Dr. Ken for um, uh, letting me participate um, in this conversation. My name is Claudia Cisneros. I am a journalist originally from Peru. Um, I arrived here to Athens, Ohio in 2017 and studied a master's in communication and development uh, here at Ohio University. Um, I'm currently pursuing a master's in journalism. Um, I've also, I'm very active in social media. I have over 500,000 uh, followers on Twitter. Um, 
I work with uh, Dr. Ken in the Smart Lab uh, also because of my interest in, um, in, in social media. And I was, um, like I said, part of this interesting study of the Appalachia in uh, Southeast Ohio, Ohio. And the Appalachia for me is a place I had no idea that existed in the United States until I arrived here um, in 2017. And it was a both a beautiful and a sad surprise because of both its marginalization and at the same time for the richness of its culture. And I have since learned so much about it. And thanks to this paper also um, that we would talk about today, uh, we were able to get to know a little bit more about the Appalachians and, and hopefully to contribute to something with this region. Um, I just wanted to say that when it's my turn, I'm going to be talking about what is digital inequality or inequity, um, how we conducted the study and how we collected the data. And I will also explain the uh, concept of vital internet use, which is the concept that we proposed in this paper. Um, and finally, I will refer to how this pandemic has um, validated this, this concept of vital internet use. Um, Finally, just in this introduction to say that um, I am part of a, a, a team who uh, worked on this research with Dr. Khan, who led it, um, Dr. Welser, Haone Manatok, and um, Aika Carlina Aitris. It was conducted, the research was, was conducted in 2018 and published in uh, 2020 in Telematics and Informatics Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Jan McGarry. Hi all, my name is Jan McGarry. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I have spent my entire life in Appalachia. I was born and grew up in Logan, Ohio. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's from Ohio University and then with my master's from the University of Rio Grande. I have been a teacher for Athens City Schools for 18 years. I taught first grade for eight years and second grade, this will be my 10th year in second grade. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor of early childhood education at Ohio University. Most importantly, I am the mom of a 13 year old, soon to be eighth grader at Athens Middle School. And in the past, I've also had the opportunity to go to Washington DC to sit down with our representatives in the House and the Senate to advocate for broadband access in Southeast Ohio and for net neutrality. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this discussion as both a parent perspective and as an educator. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee Khan. Hello everyone, thanks Nick. Um, my name is Lee Khan, as you all know by now. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Media Arts and Studies in the Scripps College of Communication. And I'm also serving as a director of the SMART Lab, which stands for Social Media Analytics Research Team, or SMART Lab. And we have been working since 2015. I'm the founding director of the lab. Um, the main reason we established this lab was to promote a better understanding of the use of social media in general, and analytics and data in particular. Um, my areas of interest are quite broad. Um, um, I've been looking into research in health communication, government, PR, uh, as well as business. Uh, so there are a range of things that we study within our lab. And as Claudia was introducing, she's part of a very a valuable team member in our lab where and we have been working on so many interesting things. So the idea for this paper or this research study uh, came about a long time ago when I was working on a bill in Melinda Gates research grant at Michigan State University. Um, we were looking at the, the economically disadvantaged regions in Michigan with a special, a special focus on public libraries and their role in society. So I, I love our Athens Public Library and a strong support of it. My kids love it. Um, um, I think that's a, it's such a beautiful 
place to go in Athens. And, and, and looking at that, I, uh, this sparked interest in this topic and how we came about looking at the Appalachian region. Uh, I really like the way Claudia introduced it as a beautiful, uh, but surprise as, as, as well, because uh, before coming to Appalachia, I was not aware of the economic and digital inequalities in this region. Um, and, and that was a point when I really thought that this has to be studied and brought in the form of a research paper so that we can speak from a position of strength when we are talking about the kind of issues that our communities are facing in this entire region and especially in Athens area and the surrounding counties. So uh, we'll talk about it more as we progress in the meeting and this was uh, hopefully a, a brief introduction of myself and the kind of work we do. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Shelby Roberts. Hi, I'm Shelby and I am currently a Youth Services Librarian at the Athens Public Library. Um, I am an Athens, Ohio native and also being a bit on the younger side here, I'm part of the generation that are kind of digital natives. Um, I grew up pretty much relying on the internet for a lot from social interaction to schoolwork and I see that trend kind of continuing and expanding here today. Um, I'm here mostly to talk about my personal experience with digital inequity, particularly having faced it um, both living out in rural middle of nowhere and having no access to internet at all, or now dealing with um, internet that is prohibitively expensive. Um, I look forward to seeing what we talk about here in this panel. Great, thank you. So, uh, Jen, do we have the poll results back? There we go. A lot of librarians here today. Glad to see it. <laughs> uh, but I'm also glad to see the, uh, of course, I'm glad to see the community uh, members showing up here as well. And um, we're going to have opportunities for everybody to ask questions as we go throughout this. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be lots of questions about, um, uh, about the research uh, that has gone on, that has gone into this that uh, Dr. Khan was just referencing, as well as um, uh, information from the librarians about the things that libraries are doing to try to bridge that gap. So to start the next part of our program, um, uh, Leek and Claudia, if you would uh, be willing to uh, give us a, a summary of the, the paper and your key findings in there. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the, the vital information concept, but if you could uh, share that with us. Claudia, I think uh, you can cover that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right, so I will uh, begin by um, explaining in a very simple way what is digital divide or digital inequality. Uh, the digital divide or digital gap refers to uh, people who are excluded from internet access or adequate internet access. In our research though, we prefer to call it or use the term digital inequality because we find it more explanatory of the social causes and consequences of the inadequate internet access. But what do we mean when we say um, uh, adequate or inadequate internet access? Well, internet access uh, for people who haven't like researched uh, and go depth into it, uh, I should tell you is not merely the physical availability of internet, um, there are multiple levels of accessibility and of the quality of the internet that will determine the adequacy or the equity in internet use. Um, through the literature review um, on this matter, we found the usual three levels uh, that are studied in which accessibility and inequity are measured. Are the first level, of course, is the physical uh, availability of internet. Um, that refers to the infrastructure, the hardware uh, and software, um, the haves versus the have-nots, the ones that have or have not this uh, level of access. The um, second level refers to the internet skills or literacy needed for it, the useful, for its useful usage. Th this uh, refers to um, operational skills, technical skills, navigational skills, cognitive, creative, uh, and social skills to be able to um, use the devices as well, as well as the software, the interfaces, gadgets, um, and content discrimination abilities. 
And a third level, um, it's the inequality in the outcomes or productivity from the internet usage. Um, this last one I would like you to keep in mind because uh, additional to our research in our paper, we propose, as you over, over already said, a concept or framework, uh, vital internet use that is tied to this particular level uh, of internet um, accessibility measurement. Um, and so how did we conduct this study and why? Um, digital uh, inequality, uh, as we know now, is more acute in the rural areas of the country, like the Appalachian region. According to the 2015 uh, U.S. Census, nearly one-third of Ohioans in rural counties do not have broadband, broadband uh, internet access. Also, according to the 2016 Broadband uh, Progress Report from the FCC, close to 39% of Americans, especially in rural areas, still lack access to high-speed internet access. And this is also a very important um, issue because it's not only about having the access, but what quality of access um, allows you to uh, access high-quality data, graphics, videos, and other um, services. So we wanted to explore the uh, digital inequalities in the hills of the Appalachia area of Southeast Ohio, how internet access and digital skills impact the online contribution to the community and to the individuals in terms of services and resources that are considered uh, to be vital social needs. And these are, as we identify them, uh, health, uh, employment, education, um, social media, and of course, uh, uh, government services. Um, this group of social needs is the, what we call the vital internet use. Uh, for the methods, we use a random accidental sampling technique in which we uh, will approach the participants that were coming in or leaving, uh, the, especially the libraries, those the libraries uh, as the primary locations because of what has been said already, because they are the um, there have been instrumental to, to the bridging the gap, the access gap, uh, offering computers and internet use. So this was a, uh, uh, the best place we could find to go um, uh, survey people uh, with, uh, with a paper survey. Uh, for purposes of, of diversity, we also included um, other public resources like the farmer's market in Athens County. And also we went to the community center in Athens County and to a supermarket in Perry County. And in total, we sample uh, this study in seven Appalachian counties of Southeast Ohio, Athens, Hawkins, Mates, Morgan, uh, Washington, Perry, and Monroe County. And the survey was, a, like I said, a paper questionnaire with 30 questions. It was pretty <laughs> long. Um, and it was administered in the presence of us, the data collectors, and it was returned immediately to, to, to us by the participants. Well, not so immediately because it took some, some time to um, fill it out, probably like more than 10 minutes. Um, the survey included questions about demographics, internet access, digital literacy, and skills of the participants, among others. And the total of participants was about uh, 200. Um, also, I should say that there are different clusters of internet use analysis. Uh, for example, one of these clusters is comprised of information seeking news, information seeking news, personal development, uh, leisure, commerce and transactions, social interactions, networking, and gaming. But for our investigation, um, we decided to explore the cluster that uh, we identified, like I uh, already said, as vital internet use um, that is related to basic social needs, um, acknowledging how internet um, and the ability to use it effectively uh, has become uh, so important for a person or an individual or a collective or a group uh, in its economic and political or social well-being. So we classified the uh, vital uh, internet uh, use factors into four major classifications, three major classifications, according to the degree 
of the necessity uh, to the individual. Um, the first one is well-being needs, uh, such as health. The second, knowledge or learning needs, such as formal and informal education. And the third one was um, economic needs, such as job search, employment, even um, uh, 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 trade or um, banking um, services. Um, and the fourth one was information and social uh, connectivity needs, such as social media use. And we, we added the social media use because we thought that nowadays uh, a lot of, not only a lot of the information, um, it's spread through the social media um, and it could be vital information as we are seeing now with the pandemic, but also because it's, it's, it's a stage where um, civil rights and uh, uh, citizens' rights are also, um, they also take a stance there and they can participate and exercise their, their rights in these platforms. Um, quickly, I will go through, through this, this um, four, uh, relating them to the Appalachian, so that you can see why we chose this. Um, in health, the Appalachian region is especially prone to negative effects of disease, diseases, such as obesity, heart disease, smoking, cancer, and physical inactivity. A report by the Appalachian Region Commission um, indicated that the Appalachian region's mortality rate due to heart disease, for example, was 17% higher than the national rate, and deaths due to lung disease were 27% higher than the national rate. This was a, a study in 2017. Uh, as far as education in the Appalachian region, education levels trail behind the U.S. national average, according to the uh, Appalachian Region Commission, 52 0.2% of adults ages 25 to 44 in Appalachian, Ohio have some type of post-secondary education compared to 63.3% in the nation as a whole and 65.3% in non-Appalachian, Ohio. As far as job search, commonly known uh, this region as the coal country, um, we all know that residents in the Appalachian region have historically lacked uh, employment opportunities uh, or diversity in employment opportunities and um, this has derived in higher levels of unemployment also lower levels of income compared to the national average um, and internet access has been found to be correlated with this economic participation uh, which includes finding jobs uh, via internet um, or buying or selling products but especially during this pandemic we've seen how even to apply for um, unemployment, how vital uh, internet was shown to be. And social media, uh, like I said, was included in the vital in internet usage in terms of political participation and, and access. Um, and also in terms of critical, um, in terms of, crit of uh, civic engagement, there's a study uh, that was made in 2015 involving 14, 400 American high school students um, that participated in a media literacy program and they demonstrated higher levels of civic engagement and had substantially higher levels of media knowledge of news analysis and advertising skills um, after this literacy program. So it also impacts the social media and the way it's used, uh, it impacts on the quality of the information and the civic um, exercising of the user. Um, three ways in which, um, I, I will end with this really quick, three ways in which I, I just wanted to say how vital internet use has been validated lately during this pandemic. Um, as physical services and interactions were impossible, were prohibited, or were too dangerous. And we have seen how uh, more than ever internet access, quality of the access, the skills, and the literacy uh, impacts on the use and how this uh, all will benefit more or less the citizens. Um, in social media, as I said, spread of information, uh, valid or fake information, also the means of expression and participation in terms of civil and political rights, uh, 
like the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, information about COVID, uh, true information, fake information, um, and discrimination among, uh, among those. Uh, in the job situation, like I said, the filing for an unemployment and also the job search because um, you can even uh, try going to the, the websites of the uh, different uh, places to try to look for a job instead of going door to door or calling, which nowadays no one will take a call for that, probably. Um, as far as education, and this is my last um, topic, and uh, I wanted to say it at last because um, I find that something very interesting happened here uh, in Athens with the education and, and bridging part of the gap of the internet uh, inequality. Well, when the pandemic started, uh, the superintendent for the Athens City Schools, Tom Gibbs, was uh, faced with the dilemma that most of the planet was faced, that was to resume classes remotely. Uh, but the problem, of course, was more, more acute here because of the uh, historical internet uh, gap that we are talking about in Southeast Ohio, uh, where in Athens County, for example, currently 19.6% of households still do not have a broad and internet service, according to the U.S. Census. So what he did uh, was very interesting back in March 2020. He did a hybrid survey uh, online and then phone and even door to door for those who had not responded because they didn't have access to online um, and asking who needed a laptop and internet connection, which households, households with students needed laptop and internet connection. So he found that out of uh, 2,600 students, uh, 1,900 needed a laptop, and out of 2,600 students, uh, more than 350 in 270 houses did not have internet or good enough internet. So he supplied them with uh, both laptops and um, uh, a device called a Metro Smart Hotspot um, that uh, connects to the internet signal. So for the first time, many families uh, in this area were are having access to the internet in their home uh, because it was not only for the students but for the whole family. Uh, so at least this was a, a way of, of bridging this first part of the first level of the inequity, the, the access one. Um, and even though there were 17 households who were, did not have access because of their location geographically, um, and they will be provided printed assignments uh, while the internet company tries to fix that. But I just wanted to leave uh, and with that idea because um, as we can see, the vital internet use now um, in, in a context where physical uh, interactions are uh, so risky becomes even more than ever uh, a very vital resource that everyone in this country and everywhere should have um, access to um, guarantee so that they can have this, the, the same um, opportunities of bettering their, their qualities of life and of advancement in their uh, paths of life and their hopes and their dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, and that certainly matches our experience uh, in the local libraries as we were going into uh, COVID times. Um, the, uh, one of the most significant statistics to me from our time during the closure was that our branches in Gloucester and in the Plains, Gloucester has very poor access to the internet in their area. Uh, the Plains has a fairly high level of economic challenges. And at both of those libraries, our Wi-Fi usage basically did not go down at all during the closure. Um, so people were still coming to the library to make use of the library's Wi-Fi in there. Uh, Nick, um, would it be okay yeah, if I add a few things here? Yeah, so sure. just um, to, if, if uh, I could pause you for just one second though. I forgot to mention that we did want to send out a poll to everybody to find out how you, our participants, access the internet. Um, so hopefully I didn't catch you off guard there, Jen. Yep, thank you. So if you all could go ahead and fill out that poll and uh, go ahead, uh, Lee. Go ahead, Lake. You can. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just to provide a little bit more context to uh, what Claudia was mentioning, and, and she really summed it up very nicely, but I'd like to add a few things here. Um, for our 
non-academic friends in the audience, especially when we are trying to parse out the different levels of digital divide. So first and foremost, the digital divide research has been going on for a few decades, um, beginning with the access divide. So we were actually, uh, or researchers were mainly concerned with providing internet access to places that did not have them. And this is a very important consideration from an economic justice point of view. Just as people can have internet access in one area, others also should be, no matter where they live, have access to those opportunities. And we can appreciate why that is important, especially in the post-COVID era that we're living in. If somebody does not have internet access due to whatever reasons uh, in terms of their location or the the internet company not being providing not providing those services there just because they live, live too far off in the country, then we can imagine what that would lead to. Those people are going to be left out from just about everything. Uh, whereas we now, this session itself, is taking place through internet access. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be participating. As simple as that. Research after that, in the decade following access research, moved on to the digital skills. And people were wondering, what kind of skills do we need for people to have so that they can participate effectively? And uh, that led to a lot of studies in which people were concerned with um, areas such as, can they participate? Can they write? comments, let's say? Are they able to access health-related information when they need to? Uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, but we were facing a very interesting conundrum when we started working on the research in the, in the Athens and the surrounding counties. And the problem that we were facing was that there are these pockets of areas that do not have access at all, which should have happened way back. And we're still wondering because the research had moved on. And then the latest research that is very interesting talks about not only access, not only skills, but most importantly, how are people going to participate? And that is what led to the rise of this very important concept, vital internet use. Because if we are able to parse out what is it that we want online, and then there was research that said that uh, people from economically disadvantaged communities, and that was very uh, resonating with what, what we found in Michigan as well and other parts of the country, that those people who are from minorities or those people who are, let's say, first generation students were, were the most affected ones because they were not able to not only participate, even when they got the internet, they did not have the skills, and then they were wasting time on the internet. Now, this could be a very relative thing of how we define time wasting, because a lot of entertainment can't be considered time wasting at time, uh, and, and a misuse of the broadband internet speeds that we have. But really, a lot of times we are gaining information from, from, from internet. We're trying to produce information when we're telling people what to do, let's say in the form of comments under YouTube videos, on Facebook, on Twitter, our participation really matters. And I would like to introduce a very important concept for everybody here. And that is related to engagement, online engagement and participation. So that can be split into active engagement and passive engagement. Now this is an extension of what we're talking about here. Are people able to participate? Now this is a very important question. How many of us are able to write a cohesive argument on the internet? So that's, that's something we need to instill at a very young age in the schools. And there talks about how this can be taking place through maybe through libraries. There can be certain programs that can help people do that. And, and a related thing to that would be home internet use. So our, our focus was on home internet use, but by extension of what we were talking about, if somebody did not have home internet use, then the, when, what's the next best thing? That would be your public library. Now, the public library internet is really, really important. Um, but at times, uh, what we found in Michigan, and, and maybe it could be true for other parts of the country, was that there might be a shortage of terminals. So if a lot of people are coming at a particular time, then they do not have space to sit on those computers uh, and do something with what, what they want to do. And they might miss out. So digital inequalities can, can, can be of various forms. They can, they can 
come emerge in so many different ways. Not only access, not only skills, but what are you actually doing with the internet that you get? So um, this pretty much sums up why we did this research and what is this going to lead to and what, does, what questions does this raise in our minds so that we can explore them further. Thank you. And that's, a, that's an excellent point about that, you know, it's great that public libraries have the access that we do, but then being able to access what's in the library is, is hugely important. In Ohio, we are very, very fortunate to have a long history of well-funded libraries, and that has given us a great deal of strength um, in libraries in our state. But in other states where there is not that uh, statewide funding of libraries, you can have vast differences between major metropolitan centers and the more rural communities. So that, that can have a huge impact. Um, I'd like to throw this now over to the, uh, to the other folks on the panel here. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Jan and Amy, um, in particular uh, in your role as parents. I'm kind of curious, um, given what uh, Claudio is saying about um, the, the sudden jarring shift that we had, both how that went for you, but also what, what you know from your fellow parents and also um, what, what you know from your role as early childhood educators. Go ahead, Amy, I'll let you start. Okay, I think my story um, as a parent and person transitioning to working online um, is a good illustration. I don't live in the hills per se. <laughs> I live three miles from Athens. Um, my children are, well, they were in kindergarten and fourth grade. And um, when we made the transition, we took the survey that Dr. Gibbs sent out and said that we thought we had adequate internet access. We pay, you know, a hefty sum as Shelby referenced for our frontier access each month. Um, we also have cell phones and our kids have iPads. So we said, you know, we think they have devices that should be adequate for this experience. Well, wow. <laughs> I will share that um, when the survey has come again for the fall, as we know that we're going to spend the first nine weeks at least online, we have asked for a Wi-Fi device and for computers because um, I don't think that we anticipated or realized exactly how strained our internet would become. Um, we spent <laughs> hours and hours in parking lots such as the one at the library, which is a nice quiet parking lot if, if you've been to the Athens Public Library. Um, there were some parking lots on campus that were a little louder with construction. And as the um, situation improved, we did get out of our cars and spend time in, on benches at Ameritai Park in town. Um, but we spent weeks without internet. Um, there was an issue with the service down the road and every time the power would blink, which it does around here fairly frequently, every week or every two weeks, the internet would go down and a technician would have to come out and reset the internet. Um, and sometimes that took up to two weeks. I think 10 days may have been the longest um, period of time that we didn't have internet. So we, in addition to our regular bill, we added Wi-Fi on our phones, you know, so we could have hotspots, but then we're sharing those with our children while they're doing their work on their iPads. There were times when um, just the stress of figuring out how to manage all of that was more than any of the tasks that we had to do in the day. Um, so we were very grateful for uh, the library's services. Um, and I think it definitely opened my eyes to um, how difficult it is, not just for us, but in this entire region. For some people, there's no, there are no options. So I, I feel thankful that we had this, uh, the resources that we did to get through that. And I'll, I'll, add, I'll add to that really quickly that um, you were not alone in that because we did have reports from both the Athens Library and the Plains Library, which are in Athens City Schools, of parents who were very clearly sitting in the parking lot working on stuff with their kids. So uh, you weren't the only one who discovered that. And I also feel a little bit sheepish because going into the lockdown, we discovered, um, we didn't realize this up until that point, that the uh, Wi-Fi signal at the Athens Library did not carry through to the parking lot. And so we had to jerry-rig a solution during the lockdown and, and we're working on a permanent solution now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, Jan. I, very similar situation. I live in the Plains and we thought we had high speed 
internet access that would would have been fine for what we were doing um I found myself very quickly thrown into a tech facilitator position that I am not qualified to be in at all. Um, when my daughter doing her seventh grade things would be online at the same time that I was trying to Zoom with a class of second graders, which is a whole other experience and a whole other conversation to have, um, I, my computer screen would freeze and I couldn't access or people would cut in or cut out. And then on the weeks that my husband who works at the health department would be working from home and if all three of us were trying to access it we learned very quickly that it was not going to happen um i know i had several phone call conversations with parents that hadn't had access before and now had a hot spot but they didn't know how to use that hot spot and how to access zoom and so it was going to people's houses in my mask and social distancing and trying to talk to them about how to log on to Zoom and how to have their child check their email from home with their Chromebook that they now have at home that they haven't had before. Um, so lots of, lots of unanticipated difficulties, I think, that um, had to be ironed out fairly quickly. Um, I know that we had students sitting in the school parking lots accessing the internet that way, as well as going to the libraries to access it. So I think it was um, a very sharp learning curve that we all had to try to navigate very quickly. And I am also in the same position where I realized for this fall, we're going to need more, we're going to need better to be able to do this adequately. Um, yeah, it was it was definitely an experience. So I'm <laughs> I'm hopeful that the fall will be much smoother than what the spring was. Glad you mentioned that about the the helping people figure out how to get on, and that that certainly matches what uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Leek and Claudia were talking about about understanding how to use the equipment. Um, we have only just at the Athens Library started diving into trying to figure out ways to provide remote help. And so I thought I'd kick that over to Austin because he was involved in some of the early stages of, uh, of getting that started. And, um, but Austin also obviously feel free to talk about your experiences over the last year or two, um, working with people in this area, helping them figure out how to, how to use the equipment. There we go. Okay. So yeah, um, I unfortunately, I don't think I can speak a whole lot to the remote situation just because I, worked on it for so brief of a time. A lot of my remote uh, tutoring sessions were mostly over the phone, which I guess does count as remote tutoring. Um, Zoom calls, we tried working a few Zoom calls with different patrons and those were met with mixed success. Some people had no problem uh, setting up Zoom and getting a call connected. They had used it before for work or for communicating with family. Um, I know a lot of people have, just all over have become very acquainted with Zoom in the last few months, so that's helpful, but um, there are still people who either don't have the internet access, don't have the required hardware to run a Zoom call, um, or they don't feel like it's something that they want to fully invest their time in at the moment but so I did a lot of phone calls talking with people trying to duplicate what they were seeing on their computer on my own computer um, I get very good at both improvising and imagining over the last couple of months trying to do tech help over the phone but yeah in a broader sense um, I'm really glad uh, Claudia and Lake, Lake brought up their uh, three levels of digital access and inequality, the uh, physical access, the, um, well, let me grab, let me go back over to my notes because I have a horrible memory. Um, yeah, like the uh, digital access, the um, what to, what to look skills. for, how to be productive. Yeah. Um, all of those I feel build onto each other. That's been my experience working with people, especially um, physical access to the technology itself. Um, those people have a greater ability to practice at home and on their own free time because just like any other skill, um, digital skills require 
a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error. Um, so that if they don't have access to that technology at home, especially if they're people who are relying on the internet to access computers or access the internet, um, they are limited to learning on a schedule that allows them to visit the library, which isn't always the most convenient for a lot of people. So their learning is greatly hindered compared to people who have computers at home or have reliable internet at home. I have a great example of that. I had a longtime patron who actually followed me from the Megs Library down here to Athens whenever I moved. Um, he was an older fellow in his mid to late 80s. He was a regular patron. I met with him just about once a week, every week for three years. And we would meet and once an hour just, or one hour a week, uh, we would work on basic skills. We would go over some of the digital chores he would have to do, like checking on insurance, uh, checking on medicine, keeping up with medical reports, um, just all the basic uh, skills that had, or skills and chores that had moved on to the internet. Uh, we would go through those and keep his skills sharp there. But he also had a computer at home and internet access at home that allowed him to check in on those things at home on his own time. So he could practice in between those weekly sessions and keep his skills sharp. If he did need help at home, he would be able to contact me while I was at work. And again, over the phone, we could work through some of his problems. He would describe what he was seeing. I could try and talk him through it, explain what he was looking at. And I really was able to see a great change in him from when I started working with him three years ago to towards the end of our meetings where he could not only troubleshoot his own problems, but he could explain and teach certain skills to some of his friends. I know there were times when he would come in one week and say that he was talking with one of his older friends and he would explain how to copy and paste things for you know, things that he would see on the internet he could put into a Word document and print off. And it sounds like such a small thing to someone who's very used to working on the internet, somebody who would consider themselves a more advanced user, but that is such a great leap for someone who just a couple years ago would not be able to do that skill on their own without having someone help walk them through it to be able to go from that beginner level to being able to show his friends how to do that is just unbelievable and it's incredible and that comes with that consistent access that's something that they can work on at home and the people who don't for one reason or another have access to computers or internet at home their their, uh, their practice abilities are limited um, they're limited when they can try those skills. Those skills take much longer to develop and gel. And just in general, that inconsistent physical access ends up in just a poor quality learning for that individual person. So that's a greater, just a greater prevalence, a greater access to computers, tablets, reliable internet can really help a digital beginner quickly run up through the ranks and learn new skills just because they have that that ability to practice on their own. Yeah, and, and I also know from my own career history that that moment of realizing that you have helped that person make that leap is, is there's nothing like it. That's why that's why we're librarians. This <laughs> is what kept me on year after year. Yeah. But um, going back to what you were saying about needing that consistent access, that's a great segue to go over to Shelby. Um, because Shelby, I know that you've got stories to tell about uh, lack of access, but I also know how phenomenal you are with technology. So I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on that and also how you, how you developed the skills that you did in that environment. Yeah, um, growing up in the Plains, my grandparents had um, dial-up internet for about pretty much forever. I don't actually recall when they switched to proper internet because I was away at college at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, regarding, um, I suppose, first lack of access when I first moved out to this house that I was in here, 
I, during this discussion here, I've come to realize that every job I've had so far has been thanks to the library. <laughs> As um, I applied for my very first job out of college in the Plains Library parking lot. Um, I worked for a while as a freelance illustrator with clients online and a lot of the time when you send the final product, I sent it from the Plains parking lot, the Plains Library's parking lot. And um, up until when I applied for the job that I have now at the Athens Library, I drafted up and sent that application in the Plains Library's parking lot which um, was immensely frustrating. While it was great to have access to that through them, it meant that um, just about every trip that could have been maybe five minutes done at home took maybe half an hour or so to get done. And it becomes really difficult to kind of fit that into your schedule, especially when you start working full time or when um, you have other obligations that you need to meet throughout the day. Um, on top of that, um, the lack of know-how of, how, in, of um, how you use that technology has come up now during COVID because my younger siblings are both in school and um, they had done a lot of their schoolwork at my grandparents' house and they showed up with all of the necessary items and my grandparents had to call me down like pretty much daily for a week or two to go down and uh, actually help them navigate that and submit their schoolwork and stuff like that. Which um, I was actually quite grateful the library was closed at the time because that was the only way that I was able to do any of that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Nick, can I jump in here? I, yeah, I think that you make a really nice point, uh, Shelby, about the convenience factor. Um, how much easier it is and um, what an inconvenience it is to have to travel to do something. I would also say I was doing long days in parking lots, <laughs> like hours and hours and hours, and it's incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, I got a shoulder injury from sitting in my car using a laptop in a way that it's not intended to be used. And I think um, I am a pretty motivated individual. You know, I would never... I would never call my employer and say, I can't do my job, I don't have internet. I will find, I'll, I will hunt down the internet and make it happen. But I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that we can take for granted that people have the motivation to do that or the ability to do it. I mean, I, I just get in my car, you know, like my big complaint is it's a little bit uncomfortable, but not everyone has access to a car to get to the library to use the computer. And it may just not feel worth it. Um, to go through all of those steps and feel all that inconvenience and get your shoulder injury and whatnot as you're working in a parking lot. So I, I just wanted to, to kind of build on what you said there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, that, that that's one of the reasons why libraries in general, Athens Library in particular, we're trying to find additional outlets to provide the internet. We're trying to find more and innovative ways to, uh, to get the equipment out to people. Um, uh, for, for our part here locally, we already have community Wi-Fi hotspots in, Ames, in Amesville and New Marshfield where we don't have a branch. And we're looking to expand on that. And uh, we also will be bringing back the bookmobile um, by the end of this year and that will have internet access and uh, computer equipment on board. So. Um, my, my main challenge there has always been that um, we're, we're, we're just plugging the little holes in the dam. We're not really fixing the dam itself. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's why we're here tonight to talk about that. Um, so I with that, oh, I, can go I, ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I would also like to mention, um, particularly working as circulation staff, since we've gotten our fleet of mobile hotspots, I truly don't think I've seen a commodity more clamored for that we've been able to provide than the ability to take the internet and bring it home with you. And that's just mobile internet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're grateful that we're able to offer that. And that's another program that we're trying to expand. We're working on grants to be able to expand that service as well. Um, so Nick, if I can quickly yeah. add a very important mm -hmm. point here. Sure. Uh, and this is in relation to what Austin uh, was just talking about. He gave a classic example of how um, he was able to guide over a period of time and build certain literacies in, in individuals who were visiting the libraries. So when you read the research study that we did, you might see a seemingly conflicting situation when 
we talk about the importance of home internet versus the, the, the library internet. But I don't see it that way. Actually, um, this would be, uh, we've been actually thinking about extending our research to talk about how does the media literacy and the participation gap that we were talking about actually um, manifest itself? And, and most importantly, how do we build those skills? And the way we can build those skills are, yes, through online education, but there are times it's again a problem Then, if you are not able to go online and participate and gain access to those resources, where do we go? So the best starting point for that would be public libraries where they can go and be guided into, and those skills could be built in those places. And that's, uh, that's a great start. Home internet, yes, is very important from our research, but then those skills, where do they come from? They come from the public library. So that's, that's the very important piece that we'd like to highlight in our future research. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, something that I've said to colleagues for a very long time it, and, and in presentations like this is I would love to get out of the business of just having to get the equipment in front of people. I would love to be able to transition the resources that we have into the education piece of it, into the training piece of it, into truly leveling that playing field. But right now, so much of our infrastructure and so much of our resources needs to, uh, needs to go towards um, just even providing the access to begin with. And, and if access was universal, then we could focus our resources on, on the educational aspect of it. Um, so now I would like to go ahead and get the poll results from the uh, poll that we did there before. And it looks like most of our viewers are uh, getting their home internet connection. Just a few of you uh, are picking it up by a cell signal, um, which is not too surprising to me given the fact that we're all here on Zoom. <laughs> but <laughs> Um, I, one of, an interesting aside about that is that um, we had several people who expressed interest in viewing uh, the program at our uh, several of our branches out in the county um, outside of Athens City, and they were not going to be able to tune in live because they get their internet access from the library, and our branches are closed right now. So, a little bit of irony there. Um, so, I think that we can go ahead and uh, open it up for questions now. Um, and I see that we've got a couple of things going on in the chat here. Um, so while we work on the questions, I just wanted to quickly see what was going on in the chat here. Um, uh, Kelly, to your point, um, it, it depends on, Kelly uh, asks, do government funding or policy decision makers take issues related to digital, digital inequity seriously? or believe that it is something worthy of their time and attention. And um, in, in my experience, and I'd love to hear what the rest of the panel has to say about this, um, it really depends on the, on the government official or lawmaker. I've now spoken with two FCC uh, commissioners who both are taking the issue very, very seriously, but I know that there are others on the commission who may not be quite as much or might have a different approach to it. And then similarly, I've had um, interesting discussions with some lawmakers about this, but I also know from reading the news that there are other lawmakers who don't. So um, go ahead and um, uh, if there's somebody else in the panel who'd be interested in speaking to that, that would be great. Uh, I want to add quickly that uh, when we were doing this research, I remember uh we looked into there's an ngo that is very active here in in uh in ohio uh for trying to get internet uh good quality internet for um ohioans and i remember some interviews on the media to the representatives and they were talking about how difficult it was in terms of trying to get for instance, uh, private um, companies to invest in uh, infrastructure due to the high costs because of the geography. And that's a big, big, big um, obstacle uh, that investors are not willing to um, commit uh, for because not only it costs uh, a lot more than if it was the infrastructure is deployed in a plain terrain, but also because of the little usage that it has. 
uh, in the area, then people, a lot of people are not really, do not really see it worth it to spend so much money monthly, you know, $40, $50 uh, for a service. Um, they don't really, they can't really see how much more it's going to improve their their lives and especially because of the you know the economic um situation of most of the region then that you know 40 or 50 dollars a month it's 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 a lot for for a low income budget so i remember this ngo i can't remember the name right now i was going to look it up but um they i think they're connect ohio or something like that right um so they were they were trying to to look into ways of um luring investors um to invest you know the companies the internet companies to invest with some help from the i think it was from the not the federal government but the state government so i'm not sure i haven't looked into it what's the status of that right now but um that was a big a big obstacle and well at least there were people trying to work it out yeah, there, there's a lot going on and there's there's a statewide um, broadband Ohio plan that's in the works right now on the state level. Um, and I know some of the legislators who were involved with it feel very passionately about it. And, uh, and as I finished talking, I remembered, of course, that Senators Portman and Brown worked together on a broadband initiative that's uh, currently working its way um, on the federal level. So th there is stuff happening. Um, I, I know we all wish it would be more and more quickly. But. Um, I see a question from Annie Bowen asking, do the hotspots work in all areas of Appalachia? Um, I'm going to guess that that means the Wi-Fi hotspots, and that actually is a major gap. Um, the Wi-Fi hotspots that the Athens Library loans um, are Sprint hotspots, and so they only cover about two-thirds of our county, and that's probably generous. Um, on, the, on the fringes of those signals, they probably don't draw enough signal to be able to be effective. Um, I know that that's one of the major issues we have up in Gloucester is that our Wi-Fi hotspots don't work up there. Um, so Wi-Fi hotspots are definitely not the, the end-all solution. They, they certainly help a lot of people, and I'm glad we're able to offer it, but, um, but they still leave a lot of people in the dark. I don't know if anybody else on the panel wanted to add anything to that. Sorry, real quick, just because I, I have the experience of the, the story I did of the um, Athens School District, and I, I had the, I remember that uh, Tom Gibbs um, stressed that out of the 270 households that they surveyed, um, they, they, I'm sorry, out of the, yeah, so from the 270 households that they, they served with the, uh, with the hotspot, there were 17 that did not, were not able to uh, use the hotspots because the because of their location and the geography again it made it impossible for the the um, connection the signal to get through um, to where they were located so I don't know that he said that he was having the internet company working on those but I don't know you know what that <laughs> entails like how how are you gonna you know make those that signal go through the geography that is inaccessible right now um but yeah so there's there was an impossibility there with some so a small portion of them uh, nick i also know a, a personal uh, a case that i know personally um there is a place right outside albany um where uh, i used to go to a farm and I know as a fact, I just knew it from somebody else who told me about this farm, uh, just for organic stuff. Uh, and um, and this this lady who, who owned that farm said that uh, she wished that there were some cell phone signals because there weren't any. She had to go up the hill just to get one bar <laughs> on the phone. So that was a real challenge because if she had internet uh, or some degree of internet, she would be able to better sell her stuff uh to a lot more consumers but she were, wasn't able to so there is a very big economic impact as well and this is just right outside albany so you can Absolutely. imagine like there might be so many more areas that do not get reliable um signals yeah, we, I, uh, I recently oh i'm sorry i recently listened in or, or watched a conversation on facebook um in an amesville group 
about internet. Um, there's a, a movement there to incorporate Ames Township, um, knowing what we're headed into into the fall, uh, because so many people don't have access to any sort of internet. Um, there were people in the, the conversation who were sharing that they, they pay over $100 a month for satellite internet, which is not reliable at all. It's incredibly slow and doesn't function well for them, but they have to have it for work. Um, but I think the need for government um, participation in building those networks um, has become evident to the people in that group. They um, have realized that the, the companies don't see enough economic benefit to invest in building the infrastructure. So they, they're trying to take it upon themselves to incorporate the township and get that um, infrastructure built so that they can have access to internet so everybody can. Absolutely. Um, and and now I've totally lost the other thing I was going to say about that, but that's totally fine. It, I'm sure it wasn't important. Um, we uh, have our other technology trainer um, uh, from the Athens Library uh, here, and she shares that one of the greater challenges I'm encountering for providing remote technology training is not only a knowledge gap, but a gap in understanding common operating system and internet browser terminology. Um, and she goes on to describe how that experience has been for her. So that, that certainly speaks to the gap leak that you were talking about um, in, in your research there. But um, I think that the, the broader point here is that even in terms of understanding how to use the equipment, um, there's, there's even more that you have to go into uh, to understand, you know, like what is a browser and what is a mouse and what, does, what is a URL and, and other things like that. There's so much that has been built up around this technology that somebody who doesn't participate in it and who's excluded from it just isn't going to know. So I don't know if, if you wanted to add anything to that or anybody else on the panel. Yes, uh, and actually that's related to another question that just came up, um, related to digital literacy being related to age. Yes, there is certainly that. Um, the more experienced we are with the internet, and that happens to be because uh, we, we might be from a generation that has been more acquainted or had spent more time using the internet. So we, we, we do have an advantage over them. Uh, and then compared to those who are from an older age group, but then there is another issue here, which we may not pay attention to. Those people who are outside those signals, they do not get a chance to practice those internet skills. And it, it, the more time, so we, research shows that uh, the more time people have been using the internet, the better they get at, get at it. Uh, and the more uh, resources they're able to summon to their advantage. Yeah. And this, I, oh, go ahead. If I could, yeah, if I could just for, uh, so yeah, speaking to trying to find the correct terminology and how to uh, get that across to people who are just starting out or who are just starting out in a specific field of digital literacy, it is one of the biggest surprises that came to me whenever I first started training, which is just how do you explain to somebody what a mouse cursor is or what purpose it serves or how a left click works differently from a right click and what difference that makes in how you use the computer. And you really, for some people, have to break even simple actions down into their most basic steps just to try and make sure that you're not skipping over some crucial link that could result in the difference between them understanding what they're doing and how to do it and just getting completely lost a few steps in. And then that digital literacy to an age gap, if I could just talk about that real quick, there is, I've, I've seen um, a lot of my learners have definitely been older adults, but I have seen, especially with um, younger kids, that they do know how to operate computers and how to operate cell phones, but it's very limited to certain skills. Like they, they'll know how to get onto the internet. They'll know how to operate the basic hardware, how to find games, a lot of games. Um, but it's when it comes to maybe trying to set up Word or fix basic problems, they're still just like any of my other learners. They are just as in need of 
teaching. It's, it's very, it's, um, they do have that further start, that further along starting point, but it's still, they do run into these issues just the same as anybody else that I've worked with. And again, that just comes from not having the ability to experience those issues and work through them on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, I'd like to jump down. There's a question for Jan. Um, what experiences did it seem your students and their families were having in the spring? Did you yourself experience animosity from people who had trouble with either access in terms of internet service or access in terms of not being familiar with the technology that you were using, for example, Google Classroom? So I wouldn't say that there was necessarily animosity, but there was definitely frustration. Um, and that came across um, you know, like I said, there were parents who hadn't had internet access and didn't have Chromebooks, and here they are with these things for the first time, and their second grader is supposed to be Zooming with their teacher in their class, and their second grader's freaking out because they're missing the Zoom, but the mom doesn't know how to get her, you know, child on the call, and it's a lot of frustration with that. Um, so, basically, I tried to find any way that I could to communicate with them and talk them through everything that we needed to do. So sometimes it was Facebook Messenger. Sometimes it was, let me call you on the phone. Um, let me text with you. Let's do, I'll make a video for you and send it to your phone. I will come to your house and stand outside on your porch and have my Chromebook and hold it up and show you how to do it because Luckily, at that point in the spring, uh, my second graders had been using Chromebooks throughout the year. So they did know how to access their email and they did know how to use Google Docs, um, which was great because we were using that Google Classroom platform. Um, I'm a little concerned thinking about the fall since we haven't had that time together to teach them already those steps in person and they haven't gotten to practice that, how that's going to look to teach that through Zoom to teach them how to access their emails and to use their Google Docs. Um, I know that, um, I know I had people that were living, I had a family that lived in the Fed Hawk district and she's like, we are so far away and I work all day and I can't get on at these times. And even when I can get on, my access is bad. So all of those frustrations, but I feel like I know that I was, and I know most of the other teachers that I talked to were like, we are going to be extremely flexible and we're going to do whatever we have to do to make this work because everybody is feeling this, these challenges with technology and access and accessibility and the parents comfort level and, um, knowledge with the different platforms that we were using were all over the place. Um, so it took, it was a lot of patience. It was a lot of flexibility for all of us. Um, but I wouldn't say I didn't, luckily there wasn't anger, there wasn't animosity. It was just a lot of conversations. A lot of conversations had to be had, whether that was in person or whether that was over the phone or whether that was little videos being sent back and forth, whatever we could do to keep that conversation going to help them so that nobody felt that they were being left behind, which I feel like was the biggest point. We did not want to leave anybody behind and we were doing whatever we had to do to make sure that didn't happen. And uh, to build off of that, um, it, it's interesting because I, I certainly, along with everybody else, saw the many comments in social media, people complaining about the situation that they were thrust into. But every single educator I know, their story matches yours. Um, the, the one that immediately came to mind was a friend of mine in Columbus who teaches um, uh, at-risk kids um, uh, who are, they wind up in his class because they have behavior problems and many of them come from poor backgrounds and all that. When everything shut down in Columbus, he was going around to their houses to drop off Chromebooks for them. So, yeah, I mean, I hear many, many, many stories of educators exactly like that, working through it side by side with the families. And, and so thank you for doing that. Um, I did want to go back up to the question that Neil had, because um, I was also intrigued by this, uh, Lake, uh, um, your uh, mention of research on digital literacy and digital access, furthering civic engagement and civic competencies. 
um, to see if anybody else on the panel is aware of anybody who's deliberately trying to connect the uh, civic engagement with online um, uh, use and, and uh, technologies. Um, I, a few years ago at an Ohio Library Council convention, I saw a company that was doing something like this. Um, it, they were building an online civic platform, but I'd have to look up the details of it. Um, but is anybody else aware of, of this? Or um, Dr. Khan, if you'd like to speak some more to that point. Nobody? Okay, well. So Nick, are you, uh, we're, we're referring to the, um, uh, if you could repeat uh, your point about the... Sure. Uh, Neil said, I'm very intrigued by Dr. Khan's mention of research on digital literacy and digital access furthering civic engagement and civic competencies. Um, and is anyone aware of any K through 12 efforts that intentionally wed those two concepts? I can't think of something at the top of my head um, at this point uh, that would wed K to 12 efforts, uh, but I would like to uh, mention that digital literacy, again, is a very evolving concept. So a lot of times people have been studying what it really means to be digitally literate because we're living um, in an age of, if I may say, misinformation. Uh, a lot of times we are hearing so much fake news coming our way just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. So uh, this is a very important literacy, which I feel the, the, the new research is really covering. Um, not only the ability to be to able to uh, participate and communicate effectively, but also uh, being able to decipher what is important and what is not important, what is true and what is not true. And this relates to another research that I published recently. Uh, which is about um, verifying information uh, so that we can avoid fake news and we can avoid misinformation. Um, there was a model that was developed. Uh, it, it talked about how we can just by having the right attitude and that attitude basically sums up into um, taking a step back uh, and not sharing everything that comes our way because the internet really functions on this principle that people start sharing things right instantly without even verifying. You'd be surprised to know that uh, there was a statistic that talked about that a majority of people, maybe like 80%, never read an article before they actually shared it on Twitter. Now, that's really interesting. Um, they just read the title of the, paper, uh, the article and they did not read what the article actually said and they just shared it. Now that's a very big problem in my opinion because um, we might, you know, a lot of these people who are spreading fake news on purpose, they've come up with titles that look so catchy and interesting and real. They also have websites that are looking very professional, uh, but the content that they're spewing out is not, is not true at all. It's not based on facts. It's not based on any research. So they are through some vested interest uh sending out this information and we, we're so surprised to see how this information because of the power of social media and the internet spread so fast and this is where i think uh in in, in education in uh in, in various programs that we have at the academic level there's already re this realization that we need to impart digital literacy skills uh um that could uh, impact civic engagement. Now, if our civic engagement, you might have seen videos of town hall meetings about not wearing a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask because of so many reasons. Now, those reasons may not have any backing in whatever they were saying. Just because somebody said that in, in some news article that came their way, um, they are believing it and they're resharing it and they're so staunchly. Uh, adamant that this is what it should be. They're denying science, uh, and this has been going on for so many re uh, years in so many areas, not just what we're seeing now in the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'll just conclude with one very important thing. All this could be uh, dealt with effectively at a very individual level, yes. Each person is responsible for not sharing misinformation, 
and also not believing if it's not true. So that's the digital literacy we need to instill in our children, especially. Uh, but very important point that I would like to add here is, out of all the research and reading I've done, I've come to a conclusion that sites like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, have a big responsibility that they're not living up to. Um, while we need to step up as an individual, and that would be the most effective thing, but as human beings, we do not always step up. As human beings, we have this tendency, we do not spend the required time to read something and then try to understand what it's saying. Um, those sites that we rely on that have really sadly become the internet, have a big responsibility to make sure that wrong information does not go out. I, I know that that is something that libraries are, are really struggling with is trying to figure out effective ways that we can play a role in helping people to navigate that information. Um, when I was in library school, which is now 15 years ago, um, they talked about how the librarian was the last person that people usually asked. And, that was a fun joke in the classes at that time, and now it's becoming, unfortunately, a, a matter of uh, a matter of some importance, uh, even more so than it was at that time. Um, um, yep, go ahead, Claudia. Yes, um, I just wanted to add because in our study we have um, a couple of uh, of other research that I think um, trying to respond to the, to the original question. Um, there's one by Martins and Hoffs, 2015, that involves uh, 400 American high school students uh, that after participating in media literacy program, they demonstrated higher levels of civic, civic engagement. Um, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put the link there in the, in the chat. And there's another one, um, I was going through it while I was listening, um, Skarik et al. 2016. That one I'm not sure it's K-12 related, but it is a study that shows social media uh, having a positive relationship with civic engagement and uh, other forms of participation. So uh, I'll add that to the uh, chat. I'd also Thank like you. to add, um, I, I did a little Googling um, while you all were talking and did find that the Ohio Department of Education and Technology Standards do have a strand that um, spans all grade levels that is entitled society and technology. So it's definitely, it's there, it's a concern, um, and it's, it's been articulated in the standards. Great, thank you all very much. Um, continuing down the uh, chat box here, um, there's a comment from somebody at Integrate Athens, which is a division of the Athens County Board of Developmental Disabilities, just making a note that um, the challenges that uh, their uh, clients face are exacerbated um, by the uh, challenges of access to the internet. Um, we certainly do see many uh, people in that category in the library, um, but there are many more who aren't able to get to the library and, and that is also a, a significant gap. Um, I don't know if that was anything in particular that came up in, in your research, Lee or Claudia, but um, we can keep moving on since that was more of a comment. Um, uh, there's a good question here about um, uh, apathy among the group where the digital inequities exist or if there was a desire for increased digital literacy. Um, and I think that this is something that, um, that uh, the librarians might have some input on as well, because um, we, we certainly have encountered people who in the library who are like, I don't want to have anything to do with that stuff. Um, but uh, I would also be interested to hear from the researchers what you what you found um, where 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 there are those digital inequities were there people who were like gung ho to go out there and and learn what they needed to learn or were were they more likely to just go I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Uh, so I guess just speaking as a librarian and one of the instructors, I feel like I might be in a unique position where. I might not be experiencing a lot of apathy because the people who aren't interested in learning aren't going to come to me to learn because they don't want to learn. Um, so I don't see a lot of apathy. What I did see was either frustration because they don't know what they need to know and they're coming 
for my services because they they've got to know how to do something to participate in just basic society a lot of especially a lot of government organizations all of their processes have moved to an online format i know social security is a big one where people if they want to access social security information they now can either wait several weeks for a paper form or they can go online and get it instantly but going online requires creating an account with social security and to do that requires an email account so there's a frustration that they have to jump through all these hoops just to access what they think they should be able to receive pretty quickly which rightfully so um, but there's also this frustration of why do i need one account to access another account and it's a case of trying to explain how completely independent all these systems are from each other and that's very rightfully so a source of frustration for a lot of people who just want to get on with their day because i do know people who don't have interest in technology and i respect that i have those people in my own family my dad uh, does not have internet at his house he only got a cell phone within the last five or six years i'm going to embarrass my sister casey who's in on this call she can agree with me um, our dad is very much not a technology driven person and it works for him it works for a lot of the people that i work with in the library who don't have an interest in technology um, and they get along fine without it most of the time except for when they urgently need something and then that's where that frustration sets in and it's more just because they don't have an option to opt out of knowing those digital skills otherwise i do see a lot of eagerness for people to learn um, the people who don't have access to these digital literacy skills right away um, they want to learn they want to know how to do these things in a lot of cases they're excited by learning all this information i i can't count the number of times i have explained different concepts to people and they're just fascinated they're excited they're glad to know that they have access to this information and that it's not as uh, intimidating as they might make it out to be and as a lot of i guess society would make it out to be so that's a lot of what i see from my point of view from uh, my point of view, ironically, I've kind of encountered a lot of the opposite, working largely at the circulation desk where people kind of walked up to the computers and I've seen people like, you know, um, sit there and like, you know, cuss for a bit, can't quite get what they're doing, and then they'll just like leave. Or on the other hand, those people will approach me and just um, ask me to do it for them. And um, some of those people, I've uh, walked them through every single thing that I was doing step by step, and they would come back a week later, same exact thing. Hey, do this for me. And um, I do understand the hesitation because a lot of it, as we've mentioned several times before, is um, what they want to do requires them to build on basic skills, slightly more advanced skills, several levels of skills that these people have never had the opportunity or the desire to kind of pursue. And um, even then, like some folks who aren't particularly computer savvy or do have that eagerness to learn may not necessarily have the ability to remember that information in a useful way. I have had people who have written down step by step everything that I've told them, including little drawings of the icons that I've asked them to hit. And still, when they're faced with it on their own, they're not able to navigate those spaces well enough to accomplish whatever it is they needed to accomplish. Thank you. Um, I saw a note here quickly uh, that there's uh, in the Eastern Ohio, they're going to try a pilot program taking remote or in-person learning to senior centers in low-income housing areas to teach the seniors, especially how to get a Zoom call and so forth. Uh, we're actually working on something like that right here in Athens County um, with the Athens County Public Libraries. And I see that this person would like to coordinate with libraries in their region. So um, please don't hesitate to send me an email after this and I can help you uh, get started on that. Um, we are uh, four minutes over. There was one last question that we had here that um, I, I, I would like to hear some of the response to. Um, again, this is from uh, Sari Cornwell, who's one of our technology trainers at the library. 
um, asking if any information was collected in the research about how people felt about their individual technology skills and experience. In my experience, people who struggle with technology can have feelings of shame for not knowing how to do things and are hard on themselves or feel like they're asking stupid questions and wondering how much those feelings contribute to not asking for help. Well, I particularly don't recall that we went into that um, uh, detail or depth. Um, but I did engage with some of us when collecting data, we'll engage with um, some of the people and just, you know, talking to them um, informally. And I remember specifically when we did the collect of the collection of data at the Athens market that um, some of the people we talked to, no, they didn't feel any shame at all. They just felt that at that time, this was 2017 or 2018, they, they didn't need it. They didn't feel like they needed it as much. Like they didn't really feel that it would make a lot of difference paying $50 a month. Um, so that, that, that much I recall, but no, in the research, we, we didn't go into those, those details. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I think that that's a good place to uh, wrap it up unless anybody on the panel has any closing thoughts or comments. Well, thank you all very much for, uh, thanks to the panel for participating in this. Um, I think this was a great discussion. Um, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, for everybody who's uh, on the call, uh, we will be, this has been recorded and it will be posted later. Um, we're also going to save the chat and send out the links that were put in the chat uh, to everybody here so you have access to all of that information. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Thanks to our organizers. Uh, thanks to Alden Library for, uh, and Ohio University Libraries generally for putting this all together. Um, this has been great and uh, hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, uh, to all the organizers for this wonderful event. Appreciate it.